Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Decryption and I hope you are well. Phones are something that has taken over a bunch of modern day and futuristic games where you can simply press a key or a button, load up your phone and then you have various activities you can do. Games like Grand Theft Auto, Saints Row, you can bring your phone up, call your colleagues to come and work with you, you can schedule activities or even call people. Other games like Destroy All Humans have fixed phone centres where you can go up to the phone box and ring certain individuals it really adds a new level to games that i think is going to be really cool for our game to add in in today's tutorial i'm going to show you how to add this phone system into your game at first it's only going to have the keypad screen but we're going to build it in so you can type in numbers from existing unknown and your friend sources and then you'll be able to make in-game calls to do whatever you need and then in future tutorials if everybody's happy we will look at adding more screens to the phone so let's get started So the first thing you're going to need for the phone is, as you can imagine, you need a phone of some kind. Now, all I've done is I've gone and set up a bunch of assets for myself in my UI phone folder. And inside textures, you can see we have a bunch of different images. The main one I'm going to focus on at the moment is this picture, a very basic phone. All it is is a model that I have in game from my Cintipacks of a phone. So just go and get any phone you want and then you're pretty much done. It just needs to be a static one unless you want some animation and stuff. The other icons I've got are stuff such as a battery icon so for the top of it we've also got call and hang up ones locked messages all different stuff even a phone background for stuff we can use so just set up a bunch of different assets but you'll know more as we go through it so what i'm going to do is come into my ui phone so outside of the textures folder and i'm just going to right click and i'm going to go user interface widget blueprint i'm going to set it as a user widget and i'm going to call it wb for widget blueprint and i will call it phone and this will be the key phone that will use for the majority of it so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm just going to come straight in and i'm going to add a canvas panel into my phone like so and i will just call this cp phone and now i'm going to add an image file in and this is going to be the actual picture of our phone so if i click it i'm just going to expand it full size and i'm going to come and set the brush the image to be my phone there we go so if i click phone you can see i've got a very large phone if i double click into this phone you can see the size it's meant to be 407 by 792 so i'm going to come and set the size to 407 by 792 and you can see it's a little bit so what i'm going to do is come back to the anchors and i'm just going to press ctrl and alt ctrl shift and click in the center one just to center the pivot to the middle and then i can come and set the size to 407 by 792 and then just to make our canvas line up with it i'll come up to the full fill screen and tick desired so now we have our very basic phone icon in place i'm going to rename this to img phone image so we know what it is and i don't need it as a variable so i'm just going to untick it to save some some space now we can actually start work on the actual screen so i'm going to come in and add another canvas panel and i'll just call it cp screen for this one i will set it to the full width of the canvas but what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to come in and manually drag in these dots so it sits just on top of the screen part portion where i want the screen to be rendered and i'll do this for all four sides there we are so now that we have that i'm going to come up to my image phone image and i'm going to copy it and actually paste it inside of the cp screen I'm going to set the anchors to be full size all the way around and now I can change this to my background So I'm going to come and select phone background I've just picked a generic wallpaper I found amongst my asset packs and I'm going to rename it to IMG phone background now one of the features I had on my phone screen just to make it look a little bit nicer was I played with the settings here to add tiling to it just because it makes it less squashed and then I also added a background blur if I drag this in just under the IMG here I can set its width to be full size and then just ever so slightly increase the blur to something like 10 I think and you can see it really just adds to it and makes it so you're not focusing on the background as much meaning the elements we put on top will be more eye-catching now for most phones they have a bar across the top which gives you important information you want to see all the time like the date the time the battery life and stuff like that in in our game it's not going to be super important but if you don't have it people will think it will bring Break the illusion of having a phone so very quickly we're just going to add this in i'm going to come in and add a grid panel inside the cp screen 
just below and I will call this GP screen. I'm going to set this to, to full size. And now with this GP screen, what we can actually do is we can tell it uniformly what rows and columns to have. So if you click on it and come into the details here, you've got a column fill and a row fill. So the columns, I know it's just going to be one column. It's going to be the phone all the way across. But because if we set it to three columns for the date, time and the battery, then the menu will be split into three screens and we don't want that. So one column across, but the row, I'm actually going to set to two. I'm going to set the first one to be 0.1 and I'm going to set the second one to be 0.9. The 0.1 will just give us a nice bar across the top and then 0.9 will be used for the rest of the screen which is exactly what we want. And now I can come in, I can add a overlay and I'm going to stick this into GP screen and you'll notice that it's added it only at the very top exactly where we need it. If you wanted to move it down you can just press the arrow to move it down into a big one and you'll see it's now took up the full size. So this overlay here I'll call this OL top bar and the reason we're adding an overlay is is I want it to have a black background so it stands out from everything else. If we drag another image in inside here and I can just come in, set it to full width and full height again, and I can set the tint to be black, but then I can change the alpha so you can just start to see the under portion of it. So I'll set it to 0.5, but it's enough to make it stand out. And if I untick the, if I untick the outlines using G, you can see it is starting to take shape. I'm going to rename this image to IMG header background so we know what it is. And then I'm going to come and add in a horizontal box now this is going to be where we start defining what's in the top bar so you can add anything you want here but i'm just going to go for three simple things i'm going to add in a text here and this will be txt date and this will be the date so you can have an in-game date system monday to sunday I'm going to control command D to duplicate it and I'll add TXT time so you can have an in-game time system. And the final thing I'm going to do is add in another image and this will be the battery life, which we won't do anything with, but you know, you could animate it or do whatever you want. And I'll call this IMG battery. For this, I'll just add my battery icon in and it's just when I found the line bit squished but we'll sort it out in a moment so for the date i'm just going to go and put a, a rough date in so we don't have a lot of room i'll just put wed for the time i will just come in and put a fake time in so i'll say something like that and then what i'm actually going to do is i'm going to come and tick the fill option and what this means is this will try and take up as much space as it can you'll notice it's not taking up the full width and that's because our horizontal box is only as big as it needs to be so if we make this full width and full height it will start taking more shape. Next, I'll come into both labels, control click on both of them, and I'll just center align vertically so it looks nice. And then for the text one, I will just center align it like so. And now, apart from the battery being a bit skewed, we're getting there. For the battery, I'm going to just come and tick center align for both options, just so it looks nicer. And I'm going to double click the battery and get the size of it. So it's 570 by 280. So I'll come and put its native size into it. And you can see it is absolutely massive, way bigger than it needs to be, but that's completely fine. So I'm just going to multiply this by 0.7 so we can reduce it. And then I'll multiply the bottom one by 0.7 as well. And this is basically just going to shrink it down until we can get it to the right size so i'll multiply again by 0.7 there we go so i basically just kept multiplying it down so i had a uniform size across both of it until i had a figure i was happy with now i don't like that these are touching the absolute sides i think we could improve that a little so i'll just tap the horizontal box and all i'm going to do is add some padding to the left and the right so i will just say and yeah that looks okay 10 by 10 so we can pad it out a little bit from the sides of the screens and that's pretty much the top bar done we if you want to animate the battery or the make the time and the clock the date actually work plug that into your in-game time and date system for me i'm just going to make it static maybe one day i'll make it randomized as well I don't. the next thing we're going to work on for the phone is actually relatively simple we just need a way to be able to change screens inside the phone so i'm going to come and search for the widget switcher which as you can imagine does exactly what it says it's a way for switching between widgets and i'm going to add that inside the gp screen underneath the top bar but you'll see as i click it it's currently in the top bar which is not what we want this is for screens so i'm just going to tap the down arrow to move it down into the screen position and i'm just going to rename this to ws screens and this is going to be our key so make sure it's ticked as a variable so at the moment that is our the phone's ui kind of done we're going to do sub components for each of the screens just to make sure we haven't got everything in one place and it breaks it up and makes it a bit nicer to work with so the thing i'm going to work on next is actually animating this phone in and out because we don't want this phone to appear all the time. So when you click it, we don't want it to just appear on the screen. It'll be a bit weird. So we're going to make it animate.
donating, almost like the character's pulling it up from the pocket into their phone. But we're going to do it on the UI, so it's kind of basic. So I'm just going to come to the animations down here, and I'm just going to click plus animation, and I will call this one fade in. And then I'm going to come and click my CP phone up here, and I'm just going to dock this animations here because we're going to use it quite a bit. And on the fade one, I'll click track, and I'll just click our CP phone here. I'm going to come and hit the track, and I'll click transform. And this is where we actually play with the phone in order to make it appear. So as it sits here, this is going to be visible on the screen as a component when we drag it in. So if I come in and click open this up and open the translation, we've got the Y here. If I tick the plus to create a keyframe, if I drag across to where I want it, so let's call it 0.5 is how long it'll take to fade in. And I'm actually going to drag this Y down so it sits below the point where it will be, like there. So you can see now, the bottom of the phone is just here above this black line two digits up. And as I scrub through it, it will move down and it will be hidden. Of course, we need to reverse this because this is the fade in animation, not the fade out. So I will drag a box over these keyframes and I'll drag it across. And then I'll drag the ending one and just move that to the beginning. And then I'll drag these to the end. So you can see now the phone will begin hidden. So our screen will roughly look like so. And then when we play the animation, the phone will fade in and it will come up. There we go. So that's the phone fading in. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add some sound effects to it because it's always better with sounds. So in my sounds folder here, in my phones, I have a bunch of sounds that I've already pre-created or pre-found. So I've got this phone in sound, which is just some clothing rustling, but that will make the sound of the phone actually being taken out of the pocket. So I'm just going to drag that inside our animation and you'll see it'll add it in. And then the next one is I want the phone to be when you turn it on to play a sound, like when you turn in a console on and it played the intro sound, but I can't have it very long. So I found this one, a synth one, or I think, and it works quite well for what I want. And that's when you turn the phone on. So I'll also drag this one in. And now you can see you've got both audios here. Now it's just a case of matching it up where you want it. So I want the phone in to play as soon as you start trying to get it, because that's when you've basically reached into your pocket and you're rustling. And the phone OS should only activate when it's almost on screen. So you can hear the rustling and then you can hear the bing of the OS activating when it's on screen. If we start this from the very beginning, if the game looks something like this, we activate the phone, it will pop up like that and we can do what changes we need. Looking good, I'm happy with that. So the next thing we're going to do is we actually need a fade out animation so we can hide the phone away. So I'm going to come in and duplicate this animation here and I'll just call it fade out. And once I've clicked on it, I, I don't need the OS activate anymore because I haven't got a sound for that. But I do have a phone out sound. So I'll come in, make sure I can see both. And my phone out is just, say it sounds like you're putting something away. So I'll drag that in just to about there. And I'll make it play straight away. There we go. So the next thing we need to do is we actually need to reverse the keyframes to make it hide away. So we can come in, drag all the keyframes again to the almost to the beginning, get this one at the beginning, move it to the end, and then drag these to the very start, like so. And there we go. So now we have our phones on screen. When we run it, it hides away. So the last thing we need to do is when this animation of the phone being put away finishes, we need to tell it to clean itself up, destroy the phone, remove the widget, stuff like that. Because you've put the phone away, we don't need it rendered all the time. So I'm going to come and add a track here and call it Event Track Trigger. And I'm right just near the end, maybe like there. Yeah, I'm going to add a keyframe on this line with the little dot. And then I will double click this keyframe to open up the sequencer events here. And this is where we can add code to the actual sequencer to run at specific keyframes. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in and say remove from parent. So this will basically grab the phone and remove it so it doesn't exist anymore. Basically deleting this widget, which is what we need. Next, because when we start the phone, I'm going to have to freeze the player. This is the part where we unfreeze the player. So we're doing it a little bit backwards. So I'm going to come in and do get player controller. And if you are running a multiplayer game, you're going to need to figure out how to get the current player who is running the phone. And in here, I will just set my input to game only. I'm using the first person concept of my game, so I don't need the mouse active when they're playing the game. If you do need the mouse active, you can set the input mode to game and UI, and this will allow you to retain your cursor. Then from here, I'm also going to drag off and I'm going to show the mouse cursor and I'm going to set show mouse cursor and I'm going to untick it because again, I don't need the mouse cursor, but if you do keep it, I'm going to right click and I'm going to do get, get player pawn. I'm going to drag up and I'm going to cast it to my player because I need to basically get the HUD where we're rendering the phone so we can remove references to it. And then next, I'll drag off here, and I'll just do Get HUD. And now we actually need to go and update the HUD. So when we spawn the phone on screen, we're going to populate 
a variable in the HUD to store a reference to the phone. And then we can just wipe the reference to it afterwards. So let's save and compile where we are for now. And let's go and open up my first person character. There we are. So you can see, you can see on event begin, I come across and I, when I spawn my HUD, I basically start, set it as a variable called HUD, which is the reference we're getting. And then if I come and open up my HUD, which is in my UI HUD here, I've got a bunch of different screens here, one for death, which I don't need, but I do need the alive one. And this alive one is where we're going to spawn the phone. So inside here, I'm going to add an overlay. And this is where we're going to store the phone and basically say, this is the position of you. And I will set it to OL phone position. And I know I want it to be in this bottom right corner. So I'm going to hold control or command shift and click in the bottom corner like so. I'll tell it to size the content because then when the phone's in there, it'll just be the correct size. And I know I want it to be just like a little bit away from the side. You can see it's like going to be a, a little gap there because I think it'll look nicer than being squashed up against the side. And I'm just going to tick is variable because that's all we need for that. Now I'm going to come into the graph and I'm just going to come in and add a custom event right at the bottom called start phone. So what this is going to do is going to basically check first, do we have the phone already active? If we do, don't do anything because the player is just pressing the phone key even though it's not there. We could tell it to go and remove the phone if we want, but I'm not going to work that way. But if we don't have the phone active, then we actually need to create it. So I'm just going to right click just across to the side. And I'm going to do create widget and I'm going to come in and put our new WP phone class and then I can drag off from here and then I can actually promote it to a variable and I can call it phone widget. And this will just be a storage, a way to actually store the widget of the phone. Now I can come in and drag in our phone position and I can do add child. And then I can plug it in just after the set. And then for the content will actually be the phone widget like that. And that will add it inside the overlay that we've had. Now that we've got our variable at the beginning, let's drag in our phone widget and I'm going to right click it and do get. And this is basically going to say, is this variable valid? If it isn't valid, then we're going to go off and create the phone widget. If it is valid, then later we can just go and hide the phone. Now, if we compile and save, that is our HUD done. So our phone should spawn up there nicely. And then in the first person character or your main character, wherever you bind your keys. For now, I'm just going to create a debug key. So I'll do debug key P for phone. You can use whatever key you want. Later, I'll convert this to an enhanced input. I'll just get my reference to my HUD and drag it in. And then from here, I will drag off and choose start phone and I can plug it in. Now if we compile and save, that's the phone almost done actually, ladies and gentlemen. That's a big portion of the phone done. So if I come in and press P now, you'll see our phone appears. There it is. It needs scaling a little bit, which we can work with later, but it's there. And if we press P again, it will just not do anything because the phone's active. We actually need to tell it to get rid of the phone. So if we come back into our WP phone now, once we've got access to the HUD, I'm just going to set the phone widget to null just like so so when this fade out animation plays it will delete the phone it will give the input back to the player hide the cursor and then remove the reference to the phone nice and simple so this is the part where we now start coding the phone so i'm going to jump to the event graph i'm going to delete the pre-construct and the tick so this construct is going to run whenever we first spawn the phone. So this is where we do our setup initialization parts. We're going to connect to the screens and we're going to tell it this is how you change screens. So when you are in the call log, you press call, it can change to the correct screen. And we're going to animate the phone in and then we're going to handle everything else we need. So the first thing I'm going to do is we need to actually connect to all the screens that we're going to have in the middle and tell them if you need to change a screen, this is how you do it. For example, we'll have a main menu that you can click buttons on. And when you click it, that'll change screens. So that component will need to know how to change a screen. When you're in the keypad screen and you're typing numbers, when you click call or back, it needs to know how to change screens. And the way we're going to do this is we're actually going to drag in our WS screens here, which is our widget switcher. And this is going to be full of all the different screens our phone will have. I'm going to drag off and do get all children. And I'm going to loop over this. So, and next we need a way to tell the, the screens, use this to change screens. So I'm actually going to apply an interface to all screens, giving them the same functionality so we know we can call it reliably. The functionality will be start where this is you've been activated, set yourself up, which will be each screen. So we're not activating every screen exit. So it clears itself up. And then we'll have a set phone widget, which is the one here where we'll pass a reference to the phone saying, if you need to control the phone, whether it's turning the phone off or switching screens, this is how you do it. So I'm going to come back to my blueprints 
folder here and in my interfaces folder just create one if you don't have one i'm going to right click and i'm going to do blueprint blueprint interface and you'll see why an interface if you don't know is useful momentarily so i'm going to call it bpi phone screen and i'm going to open this up and the first function i'm just going to name to start and this is going to be when we lo load a screen we will say set yourself up i'm going to click add new and i'll add a new function called end and this will be clear the phone screen up you're not used anymore we've turned you off and then finally i'll call add one called set phone widget and the only difference with this one is it's going to have one input of the actual phone object so i will call this widget wb phone like so now we can save and compile this and that's all we need to do with the interface so what you'll notice now is back on our phone here when we're looping through all the screens we can actually come off and we don't need to cast to anything because you can see at the moment it's just a generic widget but instead, all we can do is we can type in set phone widget and it will try to send the message from the interface. If the widget doesn't use the interface, it will just be ignored. It won't doesn't matter. But if the screen does use the interface, then it will run the code that will code into it. From the widget, I will just do self. So casting is very, very inefficient and it can take more performance than it really needs. So if you're running it often, it can be bad. So we are on a loop here and you could have hundreds of screens on your phone. So casting each one to an individual screen could take a lot of performance, whereas this interface doesn't matter. All you're doing is pushing to it nice and lightweight. Finally, after we've looped through all the screens and set them up, passing in self, which is the current phone saying, this is how you set the phone up. Now we need to start animating the phone in because it was just static now as it just appeared. So from the completed, I'm going to drag down and I'm actually going to type play animation. And in the animation, I will just drag in our fade in here and plug it in. Next, we need to reverse what we did on the exit part. So I'm going to right click and do get player controller. I'm going to drag up and set input mode to ui only like so. so this means we've just got a cursor on the screen now that's all we need i'm also going to drag from the player controller and i'm going to show mouse cursor and i actually want this active so i can click around the phone and that's it i'm going to wrap it in a comment called show phone and after this we will actually tell it to set up the first screen which we'll get to shortly so if i just compile and save now and if we come and try this time when we click p you'll see that the phone will animate in there we go how cool is that looking ladies and gentlemen the next thing we need to do is we need to give the phone a way to be turned off so i'll just right click add a custom event and i'll just call this hide phone and all we're going to do is copy this play animation and fade in i will dunk it here and i will connect it up but instead of fade in i will just drag in the fade out. now we won't be using this just yet because we're going to plug this in now if we come back to the first person character and double click into the start phone in our hood if the phone widget is valid meaning it exists i can drag from the phone widget and i can now call hide phone like so compile and save so if we now theoretically press p and press p again it should call hide phone perfect so the final thing we need on this phone widget is a way to tell it generically to change a screen so we've got the ability to tell them here's what you need to call to change screens but we actually need the code to change the screen and it is really easy we have a widget switcher so i'm going to right click and i'm going to add a custom event called change screen and this is what everything is going to call when it actually needs to change the screen. And it's going to take one input of an index ID. So I will call this active widget index. And I'm going to set this to a type of integer. And the way on the widget switcher you change screens is you actually just change the active widget index here. So at the moment, zero, it will use the first component in the list. We don't have any yet. But if I change it to one, then it will try to use the second one. You'll see it's bouncing back to zero because we don't have any. But zero will be the first screen, which will be our menu. One will be the next screen, two, three, four, blah, 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 blah. Now from here, I'm going to drag in our WS screens and I can actually get the active widget. We don't need to cast it or anything. We can just come in and say exit. If it can exit because it has the blueprint interface, it will work. And this will take the current screen what's active. So our menu or the call log, anything like that. And it will tell it exit, clean yourself up. And that will basically go through, remove any variables, do anything we need, stop calls. And then what we're next going to do is I'm going to drag in our WS screens again. And I'm going to now set its active widget afterwards. So I'll do set active widget index and I will plug it in to our active widget index. And this will now tell the widget switcher to change screens. It's important you call exit before you change screens. Otherwise, it will exit the wrong screen. So exiting straight away will exit the current screen. Then we set it to the new screen. We can drag off the WS screens and now do get active 
widget again, which will get the new active widget where we can come and call the start message, which will initialize the phone, click, do any clear up, load the logs or anything else it needs. And that's pretty much our change screen function. So wrapping in a comment, compiling a saving, now we can start work on our first screen, which will be the menu screen. So in order to create this next menu, we're gonna jump back into our UI folder and I'm gonna go into my phone and I'm just gonna right click and just create a normal widget blueprint and I'm gonna call it WB phone screen and I will call it menu because this will be the first menu you see on the screen on the phone and I'm going to come in and I'm going to add a canvas panel just so we can resize it and allow it to work all correctly and then inside here I'm just going to add a grid panel so I can nicely format the icons out if you're just having vertical icons where it goes straight down like you would on a contact screen then you don't need the grid panel you can just use a vertical box but I want my icons going across and inside here I want my icons to be three across and then three down and then it can scroll more if we really need it to so what i'm going to do is i'm going to set the column and the rows to each 0.333 for recurring and that's mainly because if you divide one by three you get 0.333 and now we can basically populate inside each of these grid sections a button and this button will basically go um here's that button and then we put one more in and we'll say here's that button and we'll keep doing that however we need a custom button to handle this and this button basically needs, needs an icon in it and then it needs to tell us when we've selected it because if you're using the keyboard or the mouse it needs to select it correctly and then we need it so when we click it it can pass the relevant info back to it and having loads of buttons in here and then having loads of click events in here is going to get really messy so i'm going to componentize it i'm going to delete these buttons what are in here and i'm actually going to come and create yet another widget but this is going to be a reusable widget and i'm going to call it wb phone menu button and inside here i'm going to firstly add a size box and this is going to basically restrict the size of this button to specifically what we want and i'm going to set the width and the height override to 80 because that's a good size for mine and then in here is where i add my button there we are so it'll look big at first but don't worry about it when we pimp it out and everything it'll look really good and then finally in i'm going to add an overlay inside here and then add two images inside of it the first image is going to be the actual icon of the button so the call icon or something something like that the second one will be the actual gray box around it which will handle the selection so this first image here i'm just going to rename to img icon and i'm going to rename this other one to img selection on img icon this is where i'm going to set just a placeholder image for now so i'll go and get messages there we go and you'll see how it's got a big gray box around it and that is our button and i don't want to use the button to hover effects so i'm actually going to come in and just change them all to none and you'll see it'll disappear and we'll just have a standard button and then our messages inside of it if i set this to the desired size it'll shrink down like so and then the selection icon here, I'm actually going to make it full width so it matches the entire size of the button. And I'm going to do the exact same for the overlay. And then I'm going to remove the padding as well. And one of the other things you'll see is even though we've made it 100% width, it's still got a padding. And if you come back to your button, you can actually remove the normal padding and the pressed padding and it'll be full width like so. You'll see that our icon is in the background and we still can't see it. So what we'll do on the selection is I'll just change this to a just a grey icon. There we go. And I'm going to make it a bit opaque. So we'll try 0.6. That looks okay. And now I can just center align my button with these ones. And then I'm just going to come and set the icon to be full width like so. And there is our button. So a few other things I'm going to come and change. The icon to be a variable. But I'm going to make sure that the selection is an icon because we need that. The overlay, we don't need to be an icon and the button, we do need to be a variable. And now on the button, I'm going to come down and I'm going to click on the on clicked event to add it in. And this is what we'll action when we actually click the button. So the first thing we're going to do is delete the event tick on the pre-construct and the construct. We're going to actually assemble this button because we want it to be a generic button. So I'm going to drag in the icon here and I'm actually going to set the icon from a soft texture set brush from soft texture and i'm going to plug this in to the construct and then all i'm going to do is double clap click the line to add a dot and i'm going to drag this up to the pre-construct as well so when so the reason we're doing this is the construct will run in the game and the pre-construct will run in the editor so we can actually see our changes on the ui and now we need to give it a texture to run and the reason we're using soft texture is so it's not loaded in memory all the time it will only load it in memory as and when it needs it so from the soft texture i will just promote this to a variable and i will call it 
it icon. And now with this variable, I'm going to come and click on it. And I'm actually going to tick instance editable and expose on spawn. Now it's important to do this because if we compile and save and come back to our menu here, I can now search for my phone menu button icon and I can drag it into the first slot here. And you'll see it appears, it looks okay. And now if you don't tick expose on spawn, we won't be able to change the icon here. So you can see I come in here and I can search for email and because we've hit pre-compile and expose on spawn we can actually set the icon directly in here which is really really cool. Next once we've done that I'm going to drag the on click down away and I'm going to add a new function called set highlighted and another one just under it called set unhighlighted and all this is going to do is set the selections visible to true or false. So I will set the visibility to be visible when it's highlighted because we're saying we want it visible and if it's unhighlighted then I will set it to invisible or collapse. And what we can do is we can actually call these buttons from the menu icon when we click on one to only highlight the one we are actually using. The final thing we need to do on this button is we actually just need to add a click event that we can pass back up to the menu. So when the menu first loads we need to grab all these buttons and say you tell me when you've clicked it because then we can do some specific code in the menu for these buttons and then if we then later we will reuse these buttons on the call screen in order to end the call and we can take over the functionality right there and then so just in the event dispatchers here i'm just going to create a new event dispatcher called ed clicked and all it's going to do is have an integer called widget switcher index because these buttons are primarily going to be used for changing the widget we're on. And then from here, I'm just going to call ED clicked like so. And you'll see it's requesting a widget selector because we've put it here. And now from here, we can actually just create another variable called widget switcher index. And I'm going to come and tick this as instance editable and expose on spawn as well. And you'll see now on the main menu screen, we can come in and we can actually set the index of what it needs to switch to. So on the menu screen, when we have all of our screens in here, we can set this integer to change which screen inside here we're going to be looking at. Nice and simple. One other thing I'm going to do while we're here on this button here is I'm just going to add a click event to it. So when we actually click the button, it plays a sound. If I drag this off and do play sound 2D, I can find whichever sound I want to activate when I click this. And I've gone and found some sounds that I like for the phone. So this is the sound I'm going to use just to click sound so I can drag that into there. But because we're trying to make this button reusable, the sounds may change. So I'm also going to promote the sound to a variable and I will call this clicked sound. So we know it's different from any other sounds we might do. And then I will also just to make sure instance editable and expose on. It should have a default value because we promoted it to a variable afterwards. So if we compile, you can see it's automatically going to use phone click by default. And that's the button pretty much done. The only last thing I want to do is I just want to set the selection to be by default collapsed so we don't see it in the actual menu. And I'm just going to untick it here so in the editor it looks correct. There you go. We can see it's there. It's a bit stretched, but once we populate all the grids, it will actually fix it. This first item I'm actually going to call PMB for phone menu button. And I'm just going to call this one call. And then for the icon, I want a call phone call icon like so. The widget switcher index won't be zero because zero is going to be the menu. So I'll set it to one and I want the phone click sound. So that's fine. I will then duplicate this and I will do my next button, which I will set to email. I don't have ideas for them all. And I'll just press the across and I'll type in here email. So this is something we can do in the future. I'll set that to screen three. I don't know. I'll control slash command D it one more time and I will do messages if we want to do text messages put it to the last side and I'll put messages in and I'll set that to four I don't know and now I'm going to actually duplicate it one more time I'll duplicate the call one but I don't know what I'm doing for this one so all I'm going to do is actually just set it to a disabled one for now so I'll say disabled one and I believe I've got a locked icon Yes. In case you're wondering where I get all my icons from, I use the Noun Project website. It's a fantastic website to get icons. It's not sponsored. It's really, really cheap. And you can get millions of icons, 5 million icons. There's all sorts on there. So all I did is search for locked. And you can see I've got loads of locked icons. When I sign in and pay, pay my premium, you can download it and do whatever you want. Really, really good website. That's what I use. And then for this disabled one, I'm just going to set the widget switcher index to minus one because I don't know what it is. And I'm actually going to come and set the enabled here. So I'm going to untick is enabled. And then I can drop this down like so. I can duplicate it again. 
drop it across and then I can duplicate it one more time just to populate our grid so a bunch of locked icons looks better than it glitching out like it was and then the final one will be number six and I'll just put it there now that we have that screen almost done we need to code it up if I come back to our phone here and search for screen and find the menu screen when we drag it into the widget switcher screens you'll see it will appear now it needs a bit of work on the styling cost all the icons are massive so if we come back to the phone button icon I'm going to assume it's this icon so I'll just center align it and I'll Increase the size of the icon to 64 just so it looks a bit nicer. Compile and save. That looks better. There we go. I'm still not a fan of the background, but I'm not a UI designer. So there's there's our old buttons there. And if we were to actually play the game, we can click the buttons. So you can see we can come and click the buttons and it plays the sound. It's not got any hover effect or anything on it yet, which is something we can look at resolving. But it's getting there. So back on this menu button, I will just come back to the button and uh, let's add a hover effect to it. So I'll say it'll be a box and I'll just set it to the same color or same tint as the icon. There we go. Let's see if that looks. There we go. So now we can clearly see which button we're going to be clicking. I could probably work on the colors, which is something we'll do later. But I'll also come in and add a disabled one so we can actually know when something is disabled i'll paste the same color in but i'll make it a bit more prominent so we'll keep that at 0 0.6 but on the hover i will actually set it to 0.4 and i will do the same for the selection just to make sure it looks okay there we go so you can see these are disabled now and one last final cosmetic tweak i'm just going to click on the button and set it to center aligned instead of full stretch it, all this means is on the phone menu it just takes up as much space as it needs to rather than filling the entire thing up Perfect. Perfect. And now the first thing we need to do in the code for this menu is we actually need to make a, an array of each one of these buttons so we can actually bind a click event to it and know what it's supposed to do. So in the graph here, I'm just going to come off and delete tick because we always delete tick. And I'm actually also going to delete the two events because we're going to implement our own interface shortly. So inside the functions here, I'm going to create a new function called cache buttons. And this is the function we're going to use to actually go off and get all of the buttons and then store them in an array. So we can loop over them to make them easier to work with so the first thing we need to do is actually go back to the grid panel here and i'll call it gp menu buttons and i'll promote this to a variable so when we come into the graph we can now drag this in instead of dragging each button out one by one we can just come here and choose get all children and then we can loop over this from here we can drag off and we can just cast to our phone menu button and we'll plug this in thankfully there's not a lot of menu buttons here so that's okay and then from here we need to add this button to an array so i'm actually going to come up here and create a new variable up here called menu buttons and I'll set it to the type of my phone menu button which is the WB phone menu button I will right click on it to change it to an array or you can come down here and change its type and now right over here I can drag this menu button in and I can choose add and then plug in our new button like so the next thing what we want to do is drag over from this phone menu button and choose bind event and then you will see our on clicked event dispatcher here called bind event to ed clicked if you don't see it make sure on your button you have six successfully created the event dispatcher and you have called it down here now with this i can drag off the event and do add create event like so and then inside here i'm just going to choose create matching event which will create an event here with all the correct inputs we need and i will call this menu button clicked i will then cut this and move it back to the event graph just so it's in line with everything else perfect the next function we need to create is when we actually click one of the buttons on the menu icon we need to go through all the other buttons and set them to their unhighlight state which is the one without the background and then we can set our current button to its highlighted state so if you're using the arrow keys or a controller you can move across and know which button is highlighted at a time so inside the menu and the graph again I'm just going to create another function called set selected menu button and I'm going to add in an input for this function and it will be called target button and I will set it to the type of our menu button and this will basically be the button that we've clicked. So we can come in and we can loop over all the menu buttons. And I can, on each one of them, call set unhighlighted like so. And then from the completed, I can just drag off from the target button and say set highlighted and plug it in to the uncompleted here and that's this function done it's a nice short and sweet one but it does get used often so we'll loop through all the buttons set them all to unhighlighted and then the button we have clicked we will set to highlighted and now with those two functions complete the next thing we need to do is actually come in and implement our interface so earlier we created the interface which for the phone screen which gives our screen a bunch of functions and now what we can do is come into here and on the class settings down at the bottom 
system, you will see implemented interfaces. So we'll just come in and add BPI phone screen. And all this interface is going to do is tell anything that talks to this screen, this has these functions so you can call them. We might not use the functions because at the moment we're not using any of them, but we very well might use them. And I've just noticed I've put it on the wrong aspect. Make sure you put it on the actual screen. There we go. So I will then come and double click each of these functions to add them into my code like so. And you'll see they've got a special icon, which means they're an interface. So on the event start, all the first thing I'm going to do is call cache buttons. So as soon as we load this screen, it it will cache the buttons and stick them all into the array. Then after this, I'm going to drag the set selected menu button and I'm actually just going to tell it to get the first menu button and call get and then plug it in here. So all this is going to do is cache the buttons and then as soon as it loads this screen, it's going to set the first one to be the selected one. So if you are on a keyboard or a controller, the first one will be selected. All you have to do is use the arrow keys to move around. If you're on a mouse cursor, it will just overwrite it and set it to whichever one you click. Next on the event end, I'm actually going to come in and just clear out the menu buttons so when we leave the screen we don't need this array to be populated with something we're not using so we can clear that out on the set phone widget this is what allows us to actually reference back to the phone to change screens so i'm actually just going to grab this widget and i'm going to promote it to a variable like so and call it phone widget and now that we've got that reference there on our click event here all we have to do is drag in our phone widget and call change screen which is where we plug in our active index as it's expecting us to and plug it in. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, if we compile and save now, and if we jump back to the phone here, the first thing we need to do is tell this screen to initialize itself. Because at the moment, nothing is going to initialize it unless we chain, call change screen on our phone here. So we need something to start the initialization process. And that is as simple as coming up here. When you show the phone successfully, all I'm going to do is just manually drag out the menu screen and just trigger the start sequence on the BPI phone screen message. And that will tell the, the menu screen to start initializing. If we load it now and load it up, you will see we have a phone. We can highlight aspects what we want. And if we click this phone one, you see it's all working really, really nicely. We can't click the disabled ones as we didn't want to. So the next stage is to actually make these buttons change to the correct screen. And the screen we're going to look at is going to be the keypad screen where you click this button and you'll have a bunch of numbers where you can type and call a number. So in order to get started with the keypad screen, I'm going to come to the UI screen and I'm going to come into my phone and I'm going to duplicate the menu screen here because it's got all the interface set up and a bunch of stuff we already need. And I'm going to call it phone screen keypad and I'm going to open it up. So you might think that we can reuse these buttons we've got. However, it will limit us if we reuse it because if we ever come in to style the keypads numbers and the menu buttons differently, we'll struggle because they'll be the same object. And we technically need one to change widgets, whereas we need another to simply add a number to a text field. So even though the buttons are very similar, there's enough differences that we need to change the button. So I'm going to come and get this WB phone menu button. I'm actually going to duplicate it and I'm going to rename it to phone keypad button like so i'm going to open this up so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm just going to come and delete the img icon because we don't need it but everything else can retain the same if you of course want to style it differently absolutely feel free to but what i'm going to do is just add in a text underneath the overlay like so and this will just contain numbers of what we need to press so i'm just going to press one and then you could increase the size if you want you can really do anything you want i'm going to keep it at like 24 then and i'm gonna i'm not gonna make it bold because i don't want it to be the thing that stands out that's horrible regular and now when we jump into the graph and i'm gonna rename it to txt x and i'm gonna tick it as a variable and then i'm gonna come into the graph here and you'll see there'll be a few errors where we're trying to set the icon here so we can just delete these off because we don't need it and i'm gonna also delete the icon that we pass into it because we don't need that either Instead, I'm going to create a new variable called button text, and I'll set it to a type of text. Then don't forget to tick instance editable and expose on spawn. And then all we're going to do is simply set the text of this button to the button text. And then we're going to simply call this on pre-construct in construct. Next, this set highlighter can remain the same. That's not going to change. You can change things on the numpad if you want to. And then on the clicked event, we don't actually need to return the widget index anymore. So I'm going to delete this off of both and instead I'm going to come to the event dispatcher and change the inputs it requires. The first thing is the actual button. So I will just return and the type of the button and just return itself. So when you click it, it will tell our 
keypad screen which button has been pressed so we can go on and get all the info we need and then it will play the clicked sound which we can keep because we can modify it and that's pretty much this new button done so we can compile and save it and jump back to our keypad and i'm just going to come and delete all these other buttons because we don't need them and instead i'm now going to come and add our new keypad button and you can see it's plugged up there quite nicely i can come in and set the button's text to be one and that's looking okay but just noticing one thing we haven't done we need to tell it what text to return because you might not always want it to be one two three and return one two three you might want it something else so i'm actually going to duplicate the button text and actually change it to payload text so it knows so we can simply say this is what this button is going to return so it's like a temporary storage what we can use so in my case i will just simply set them both to the same thing but you very well might want it different the other thing i'm going to change before i start duplicating them is i actually have a custom sound for the number button so you can see when i press a number i'm going to click number press and i'm just going to do it and now that we have number one i'm going to rename the button to be phone keypad button underscore one and I'm going to hit the control command D a bunch of times, delete that one off. So we've got two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I can just bump it across to get the layout that I want. And you can also use the arrow keys. If you click your number, right click in the screen and wiggle around, you can use the arrow keys to place where you want it, like so. And you'll see the buttons look really big, but that's just because we haven't fit them in properly yet. So I need to duplicate this one more for zero. And then I can place this in the middle there. And then we need one more row under it, which is going to handle the pull buttons, the action buttons for it. So this time I'm not going to put a phone keypad button in. I'm actually going to go and get the menu button because these three buttons at the bottom will actually need to action something. Whereas these numbers need to just change the number on the screen. So I'm going to get the phone screen menu and I'm going to drag it in just underneath. And then I'll just dip, move it down to the bottom like so. And then I will duplicate it twice. One to move across and then one to move across again there we go and you'll notice that it's a bit squished in places and not uniform all we need to do is go back up to the grid view here and add two more rows to it so we've got five rows and just change them all to point two and you'll see they will all slowly match the correct size which is why grid panels are very very good now i can go through and i can just update these all to the correct numbers there we go so there's all the numbers correctly input now the last thing i need to do is just update these bottom action buttons so my first action is going to be the back button so i will just call it pmb back and i'll change the icon to be the back icon there we go and then the widget index needs to go back to the menu at this point so i know that is zero and you can figure that out by going back to your phone and just counting the number of screens under it starting from zero so the menu is zero and while we're here we can actually come in and add the keypad screen and we can add it under widget screens and the benefit of the screens is you can just simply select them up and down so you can see it's coming along quite nicely already and that's all the widget switcher does is change it up and down just like that then i can come back to the keypad that's going to go back to zero because that's what we want the phone click is okay for me the second one will be the call button so this is what actually activates the call and that's going to switch to the next widget after this which will be the actual calling so zero one two so i'll set it to two and i'll call it the call button there we go and the final one is going to be the backspace one which will basically delete the text at the top that we're going to put in in a minute i'll just search for delete and i know i've got a custom sound to that so i'll also search for delete number and the widget switcher index we can ignore because we're actually going to bind the click event to that button to change how it works perfect so if i compile and save you can see back on the phone if i select that screen it's looking good if i delete the grid you can see it's all there nicely so you can tap all the numbers the only thing we need to do is add the box at the top so you can actually see what you're typing i'm going to grab this text element i'm just going to drop it above the grid here I'll rename it to TXT numbers and then I'm going to come over to the anchors. I'm going to stretch it over the top of everything and tick is variable. I'm going to set the font size a little bit bigger because this is a key part of the screen you want to look at. And I'll just tick size to content. You'll notice it's overlapping the buttons. And the reason is for the canvas panel, it's trying to stick it all into the same place. So if you just select your numbers in your grid panel, control X to cut them and delete the canvas panel. If you then come in and add a vertical box and paste in, you will see that now they will sit on top of each other. Then just come to your grid panel and tick fill. There we go. The last thing I'm going to do is just give this a little bit of padding. So I'll just say from the left 10, from the right 10, top will be zero and the bottom I'll just say 30. Give yourself a bit of space. There we go. And now if you come back to your phone, compile it. There we go. You can see it's there. It says text block. I think 30 is probably a bit too big. So I'll come back and I'll just set it to something like 
10. See how that looks. There we go. That looks okay. And it'll go 0712 blah, 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 and go all the way across. Awesome. Now it's time to actually start coding this keypad screen. If we go over to the graph here, because we duplicated from the previous one, the majority of this is still the same. So if we jump into cache buttons, you'll see it's casting to our menu button. We don't need this anymore. So instead, I'm going to drag off and do cast to our keypad button. And then I'm going to come to the menu buttons here and I'll just change the type of it to keypad button. And it will say you have to replace it. That's fine. I'm going to delete the ad and delete these binds and simply come up and type add again. And now I can plug in the new button like so. And then from here, I'm going to drag this button off again and I'm just going to bind onto the click event. So bind event to clicked, just like we did before. And I'm going to, from the event, just do create event. And finally, select create a matching function. I'll give it a name number button clicked i will cut this paste it in the event graph so it lines up and then come back to the cache buttons and reset the event there we are and it'll still error because there's still more stuff we need to fix which is completely fine so up here you can see it's struggling to get the first one to set it as selected so i'm going to delete this off i'm going to drag from the new menu buttons type and do get and then from here, I will do set highlighted. There we go. So that'll set the first one as highlighted for controllers and such. And the final thing I want to do is I want to grab the TXT numbers just in case the developers forgot something. And I just want to set the text to blank. So they go in and they've got a clean slate. There we go. We don't need this menu clicked anymore because we don't actually have the menu button. So that's fine. The event end, we do still need. So I'm just going to come and clear the buttons here like so. And we don't want to clear the numbers on end because when we change screen to the calling screen, we're going to want to actually grab what's in the TXT numbers. So only clear it on load. We do still want to set the widget. So that's completely fine. Then the numbers button clicked. This is where we actually set the text of the numbers screen up here. And that's really simple to do. So I'm going to drag off from this button and I'm just going to do get payload which will give us what we've actually passed into it and we want to render. And then I'm going to drag in our TXT numbers and I'm going to do set text. There we are. From the text, I'm going to drag off and do format. And you'll see it's given us two variables to populate. The payload text will be the new text and the old text will just be over here and we'll just do get text and we will equip it into the old one there. So that will now combine the numbers together. Next, we want to grab this button and we actually want to set it as the highlighted button. So if we jump back up to our set selected menu button, which is the function we created earlier, you can see all it's doing is looping over the buttons, setting the highlighted and setting the unhighlighted. So if we just to just recreate this, so for each loop, set unhighlighted, and then I can come into here and I can change the type of it. So it will be phone keypad button and I can drag off and just do set highlighted and plug it in. Now, if we compile and save and jump back to our event graph, we can come in and drag our set selected menu button and it just wants a reference to the button. So we can just drag that into there like so. Now, the only thing we've got to do is we need to populate these three buttons and tell them what to actually do. So the back button is the easiest. So I'm going to click that. I'm going to scroll down and I'm just going to add an event to the ED clicked just like so. And when it's clicked, all I'm going to do is drag in the phone widget and call change screen. And then I'm going to plug in the active widget like so. The next one will be the call button, which will do the exact same thing as the back button, except it's going to be passing a different number to it. So I'll just plug both of these in just like that. And the final one, which is the slightly different one, is the backspace button, where we just remove the last character from the numbers that they've typed in. So on this clicked event here, I'm actually going to ignore the widget index switcher because we don't need to know. And instead, I'm going to get the text of our current numbers like so. And then I'm going to convert it to a string because we can now do some more functionality to it. From here, I'm going to get the length of it. And then I'm going to minus one off of it, which is going to take one off of the length of the string. So if the string is five characters long, this will set the length in this variable to be four. Then I'm going to drag from the string over here and do get substring, which will basically tell it from this index. So the first character set the length to now be this. So it will remove the last character. If you wanted a clear, you won't need to do this. Your clear button will just set the text to blank. Finally, I'm going to convert this string back to text with two text. And then I'm going to set the text of the numbers just like we did above. So I will do drag off and do set text. So I'm going to plug it into the very start of the function and that's it. So if we compile and save now, we should successfully be able to type in numbers and jump back 
between the menus as we need to. So if I press P, the phone pops up. You can see we've got the button here. I'll click it to activate it. We now have the buttons. The UI could do with a little bit of an update, but you can come in, we can type numbers. We can press the backspace and it removes the last one. We can keep typing as much as we want. And then we can press the back button to jump back to the menu. And when we go back in, it's all done. Perfect. So let's go and fix the button. So if I jump back to the keypad button, let's take a look. So just coming in, I'm going to set the text of the button to one so we can actually see what it looks like. I'm going to enable the selection so we can see it, so you can see it's bumping it across. So I'm going to click this button here which is still very small uh, I'm going to go to the size box and this is where the difference as I was talking about I'm going to increase the size of it just ever so slightly just so it's a bit bigger and then on the text I'm going to set it to center width and height so it's in the middle and I'm going to give it some padding of 20 all around except the top and the bottom will be 10 just so it's more of a square Let's see what that looks like now. You can see we jump into the phone, click into it. You can see we've got a much more prominent button to be able to click. So the only problem with this at the moment is I can keep spamming numbers and just completely go off the screen. That's not right. It's a good practice to set a limit to how many numbers they can actually add. And that is actually really simple to do. So I'm going to jump back to my phone, but I'm just going to add a new function called validate text. And this is actually going to do a lot of the similar prospects to the deleting here so i'm going to come and copy the txt numbers text string len and i'm going to paste it inside this validate text function and this time i'm going to drag off and say equals equals and i'm going to say for the for the uk phone numbers mobile numbers are typically 11 characters long so set it to whatever culture you want to so i'm going to say if the length of the button equals 11 and in the uk that is what mobile numbers typically are 11 digits long then i want to disable all the buttons so i'm going to drag the menu buttons here and i'm just going to for each loop drag the x second and from the array element i'm just going to drag off and do set is enabled and i'm going to plug it in to the 11 characters here and that's not going to work so i'll just drag off and do not boolean like so and connect this up instead yeah if it's not equal to 11 then it will enable the button so you can click them but if it is equal to 11 then it will disable them so you can't click them anymore so i'm going to jump back to my event graph and then all we need to do now is call this button in the correct places so the first place we need to call it is on the delete so where if you reach 11 and you click delete it gives you control back the next one is if you click a number. So right at the end, as you click a number, it validates the text. And the final place is just on the start here. So as soon as you set the text to zero, it revalidates the buttons. And now if we compile and save and jump back into it, press P, you'll see we can jump into the call screen. And as we type numbers, eventually they will become disabled like so. So I can no longer click any of them. All I can do is go back, click call or delete one. And as we delete one, it gives us control back. Perfect. So if I click call, at the moment, nothing happens because we haven't got a screen. But that now leads us on to the next screen, the call screen. So this final phone screen, the call one, is by far the most complicated one we've done so far, only because it has more logic in it for what actually happens. It checks all the registered numbers in the game. If the number exists as an actual number in the game, it's as in the players haven't just mashed buttons, then it will check if the player actually has unlocked that contact. So for example, if you have played the game before, and you unlock somebody's number then you come to the game at the beginning and try to type that number in i want it to still contact that person but because you've not unlocked that contact yet you don't know who they are it will just go to their voicemail and they'll answer it thinking oh i don't know who you are so there's multiple stages to it and if you do know who they are because you've unlocked it then it goes to some dialogue with them so there are multiple stages to the phone system which is why it makes it a little bit complicated but stick with me and it does make a lot of sense when it's once it's done but the first thing we're going to do is we actually need a way to store the contacts on the player so i'm going to come into my blueprints here and i'm going to come into my structs if you haven't got a folder just create a folder called structs and i'm going to right click and do blueprint structure and i'm going to call it s underscore phone contact i'm going to open this up so the first variable i'm going to add is name and this is going to be the name of the person that shows on the call screen and we can also use it later on the contact screen next is the picture most people have a picture of somebody on their phone if they don't it just says some random numbers but i'm just going to come in and add a picture of each person because i think that'll be pretty cool i'm going to set it to a type of texture 2d but i'm going to come into it and click soft object reference this will mean it's not loaded in memory all the time only when we try to use it a lot more efficient i'm also going to come in and add a line busy sound and this is going to be if there, it is a real
serial number, but you haven't unlocked the contact or you're in a mission, then it'll play the line busy sound, which is basically a voicemail. And I'm going to set this to be a sound base, but I'm actually going to, again, going to tick soft object reference so it's not loaded in memory all the time. And then the final variable, which is where this tutorial slightly differs, is how you store which dialogue happens if you can contact this NPC. So if you've got a custom solution, this is the part where you put in the class file that you need to jump to. For my dialogue, if you know my channel, I'm going to use the plugin narrative is a paid plugin, highly recommended if you are looking for a quest or dialogue system. Because the vast majority of this tutorial is more generic, this can be anything you want. If you have a dialogue system, plug it in. If you don't, you can probably just put a blueprint class in here that plays a bunch of audio files or even a sequence, a level sequence. But for me, I'm going to come and set it to the type dialogue and I'm going to pick a, a soft class reference like so and I can save and compile now I'm going to turn this off and I'm going to jump back into my blueprints folder and I'm going to go into the data folder now and I'm going to right click and I'm going to do miscellaneous and data table it will ask what row structure you want so I'm going to call it s underscore phone contact and I'm going to click ok and it'll ask you to name it I'm going to call it s underscore phone contact and I'm going to open it up so this is where you start building the master list of all contacts in your game every single number you want whether the players unlocked it or not at this stage this is just the contact so this is your data pool of them so i'm going to click add in the row name i'm going to double click and type the number that the player can type so for my first one in the uk to call the police is 999 in america it's 911 in other countries it's something else i want the player to be able to call the police which i think will be pretty funny and then in row name so that'll be my number and then i can come down to the name so the name of the contact will be the police the picture will be a picture so i believe i've got a picture of a police helmet or something the line busy sound is the sound that you want to have if you if you can't get through to them for whatever reason i'm going to say you can pretty much always go through to the police otherwise they'll say the number is not available so we'll keep it empty and in the dialogue i actually need a dialogue file so this is again but in my dialogue you can see i have a phone contact for the police here and all i have done for the narrative people dialogue spawned unticked everything else but can be exited unticked because we can exit the call at any point and then all i've done is set the speaker to be police in the dialogue graph i just have the police saying hello please here how may i help with some voice lines and then the player has a variety of um non-professional things he can say little jokes that you can reply to him and the police will say that's not funny do not call this answer again so you basically prank calling the police i saw it destroy humans it's really cool so we had him this can be anything you want and then all i've done is then i'm just going to assign it into the police here with phone police there we go the only other thing i'm going to do for a test is i'm going to add an ex a real number in the game well, I'll just say, I don't know, 07, 1, 2, 3. It's just add a fake number just like that. I've got no idea whose number that is. And the name, I will just set it to one of the people here. So I've got Lily Thompson here. So I'll set her name to be Lily Thompson. And then her picture, I don't have one at the moment. So I'm just going to put, leave it blank. And then we'll handle that in code. For the line busy or Lily, I believe I have a sound effect. So for Lily, I just have a sound effect of her voicemail. There we go. So I can drag that into her sound. And currently I haven't done any dialogue for her. So we can just leave that blank. So this is the three states of numbers. You've got a number that you do have the contact for. Uh, you've got a number for somebody you don't have the contact for. And then you've got a number you don't have. Now that we've done that, we need a way for the player to store what contacts they've unlocked. And you might be tempted to put it on the player. But the player's variables will most likely reset every time they change a level if you have multiple levels which won't work so instead what i'm going to do is actually use a game instance which is something that spawns up when you start the game and then it persists for the entire game duration of your gameplay no matter how many levels you change and then it will be deleted after you quit the game and that's how you can go and handle it saving it and such so i'm going to come to my blueprint class and i'm going to search for game instance and I'm going to click game instance, click at select, and I'll just call it GI main, because that's fine for me. Inside here, it's just a completely normal blueprint class. So I'll just add a variable of unlocked contacts. And this will literally just store a text variable, but it will be a type of array. And this will just be a list of all the contacts you've unlocked. So what I will do is default a contact in it of 999 like so <clears throat> but one thing i have just mixed up you just need to set it to a type of name instead because this is the type that the data row uses so you can simply just say from this data table get this unlocked contact and now that we've created a game instance all we need to do is actually enable it so if you go edit project settings and in maps and modes just set it as your main game instance 
it shouldn't break anything unless you already have a game instance in which case make sure you populate that but you should be fine other than that now that we've created that we can actually work on the call screen so i'm going to jump back to my ui my phone and i'm just going to come and duplicate the keypad screen it's going to be very different so we're not going to actually copy that much from it but this gives us a good starting point and i will call it call phone screen call because this is the calling one the txt numbers and the virtual box so i'll keep that the txt numbers i'll just call txt number because that's the number we're calling so as a test i will do just just a, a random number off the top of my head and then i will duplicate this and i will call one txt status and this is going to be calling call ended call in progress stuff like that so I'll change the text of this to calling. And then the final text I'm going to duplicate is just TXT contact name. And this is going to be a name of the contact. So if you dial an existing contact, it will say Lily or the police. So I'll just change this to Lily Tom like so then i'm going to come and add an image because this will be how we show the actual profile picture and i will call this img contact profile picture and i'll just for now set this to uh, the police as one because i don't have another one there you go and you can see it's messed up but we're going to resolve this in a minute and then the final final thing we want is just a menu button which is going to be the hang up button so i'll call it pmb hang up this will jump back to the main screen and the icon will be a red hang up icon. So, so now we just need to reorganize this. So I'll set the calling to be the top one because that's where I want it. I then want the profile picture to be the next one. So it says calling, it says the profile picture. Then I want it to be the name of the person. If they've got a name, if not, we'll just not show anything. And then the number and then the hang up button. So now if we look at improving this, so I'll set this to be center aligned like so. I'm gonna set my screen size to desired so I can see it in better glory. I'll set the image size to 128 by 128. That looks okay. We could probably maybe go 200. Yes, I think that's okay. I'll set the calling to be center aligned, just like with the justification. Lily Thompson and the number, I will also set it to center aligned, just in case it's a bit bigger and the number sits there. Uh, I would like the number to take up the most space. I'm actually going to tick the center aligned horizontal, but the fill vertical. And what this will do is if this height gets longer, so say we don't show the text or they don't have an image, then this phone will always remain at the bottom. That's the hope. So just making sure everything is ticked as a variable so we can access it. Perfect. We can now jump into the the graph so the majority of this is probably going to be deleted so we can delete all of this delete that we want to keep the event phone widget because we need access to the phone if they click hang up and we will clear the menu buttons but we don't actually have menu buttons so we can get rid of that and then this cache buttons and set highlighted one we don't actually need so we can get rid of this as well i'm going to come and delete these functions so we really only have kept the odd little bit and I'll delete the menu button. So to start, when you ring the phone, I want it to go bring, bring. Uh, I think I have a sound effect for it. So I want it to do this sound, and I want it, to, and I want to do it a few random times. So I'm actually going to come in and create an integer variable here called random rings to play, and I'm going to set it to an integer. And what this is going to do is between zero to three, between one and three it will ring that many times just to give a sense of randomness. And from here, I will drag off and do random integer in range. And this is where you set it. So sometimes you might want them to just automatically pick up just like that. I, I don't want that. So I'm going to say between zero and three. So three rings and then they will answer. Something will answer. Whether it's the operator saying this number is not available, whether it's the voicemail or whether it's the actual. Call. Next, we actually need to populate the UI with all the details of what we've done. So this is where we're going to go off to the data table and get everything we need. So I'm going to create a new function here called update UI. And the first thing I'm going to do when you first come to this screen is I need to set the status to calling because that's what it's going to be doing. I'm going to set the text and I'll just say calling dot 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 and I'll plug it in. Next, we need to actually go off and get the number of what we're trying to call. And this is really easy to do because now we've got the phone widget. It's all lined up perfectly. So I'll drag the phone widget in and I'm going to drag off and do get keypad screen. Next, I'm going to drag off from this and we need a way to get the phone number because there's going to be a, a bunch of conversions we actually need to do to it. So I am going to compile and save this and jump back to my keypad screen. And in the graph, I'm going to add a new function called get phone number, because this is going to be useful for other things later down the line as well. And then in here, I'm just going to drag in the TXT numbers and I'm going to do get text. 
and then I'm going to drag this and do to string and then I'm going to convert it one more time to a name like so. And the reason we're converting it to a name is then it easily allows us to search data tables really, really quickly. And then all I'm going to do is just drag from this and type return and then plug this into it here like so and I will just call it number. So instead of having to do this every single time, it's four nodes, but if we do it in a bunch of places, you don't want to do it every time. So we can do it once, cache it, and then it's all in one nice location. So now I can jump back to the call screen and in here, we can just type get phone number like so. And you'll see it's asking us to execute and we could, but we can also be a bit smarter about it. So this doesn't do anything functional, it just returns data. So I can actually click the, the function and just click pure here and then compile and save. And you'll see when you come back to the call screen, it's got rid of the exec pin. So now it's just a data retrieval, which is a lot nicer. And then from here, I can promote this to a local variable. So I'm just going to call it number and I can plug it in because we're going to use this in a bunch of places shortly. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm actually going to set the text of the number here. If I do Tixie number set text, we can now plug in this, which will convert it back to a, a name, but don't worry about it. We're doing this mainly for the data table later. And then after this, we can drag off and now do get data table row just like that, because we already know what row we want to get because it's the number here. And then for the data table, we can call it, we can just search for our phone contacts one. And this is where we start branching off the functionality. So if we don't know what the row is, then we basically need to set the UI to say unknown number. And this is where the operator will speak. So for now, we'll just put unknown number and we'll carry on above. If we do know what it is, then I'm going to promote the contact info to a local variable. And I'm going to call it contact info. I'm going to plug it in. I'm then going to get a copy of our game instance so we can actually detect whether or not this player has unlocked this number or not. So I'll do get game instance and I'll make sure I click the game, not the widget. And then from here, I will cast it to my MI main, my GI main, like so. Now, I'm not going to worry about this cast fail, because if the cast fails, we've done something wrong. So we're just going to assume it's correct. And from here, I will grab out the unlocked contacts. And then from here, I will do a contains. And we're going to say, does this list of contacts contain the number we've typed in? Then it means we've unlocked the contact and we can contact them. And this is where we'll attempt to start setting the name and all the details because we know who they are. They're saved in our phone. But if it's not, then we're going to come and set the unknown contact here with the unknown UI and then we'll return correctly. So assuming we do know who the contact is, we can drag the contact info in. I can drag off and do a break and I'm going to unhide all unconnected pins except name and we can drag in the TXT contact name and I can do set text and we can populate text. So all we're doing now is just using this function in the correct places to populate the bits of the UI. So we've now updated the status. We're about to update the image. We've updated the number based on what we got from the cult key pad screen. And we have now just updated the text of the user, the contact's name. And then finally, this is where we do the picture. So I'm just going to drag the contact info off here like so. And instead of the name, I'm just going to unhide it and instead show the picture like so. And I'm going to drag from this and do is valid soft object reference so if it's not a valid soft object reference it basically means we've not given them a profile picture so like lily doesn't have a profile picture. but if they do have a valid soft object reference i can drag in the image profile picture and i can do set brush from soft texture i can plug it into the true and then i can copy the contact info picture and just paste it into the soft texture like so and this will set that brush to be whatever that texture is nice and easy however if you haven't set an image of it then we need to set it to something else i actually have an unknown icon so i will do set brush from texture not soft texture this time and then in here i will just search for unknown and i have an unknown person icon and then finally that's where we'll start returning our correct data so so what we need to do is we need to actually return in order to tell the event graph what is the current state of the UI, whether or not we know who the contact is and whether we've unlocked them and then we can proceed to handle which call we go with. Because this is just updating the UI at the moment. There's no logic to it. So in order to do this, what I'm is I'm actually going to change these variables to actual variables. So I'm going to come in and delete the contact info and the number. I'm actually going to drag from this out row and I'm actually going to promote it to a normal variable. And I'm just calling it contact info two for now. And I'm going to plug this in instead. And I basically need to replace everywhere. I've set it as a local 
variable to an actual variable. So the contact info here, I can drag this on top of it like so to set it. And then I will also do the same here. And then finally here as well. And now if we delete contact info, we should have no issues. So I can just rename this back to contact info like so. And the next one is the number. I want the number to be set as well. So I'm just going to add another variable called number and I will number two and I will set it to a type of name. And then everywhere I set the name, so it, you see it says change node to number two. And then here we'll set change node to number two. Make sure I line this back up. There's another number here, so I'll change you to number two. And I think that's all of them. So now we can delete number and just rename this back to number two. Because this means we can access it outside of this function. Great. So now I'm gonna come back to the function over here. I'm gonna actually add an output variable so we can return the results of the UI. I'm going to actually add the first one, which will be game law contact. And this is going to be if the contact actually exists in the game at all, whether you've unlocked it or not, that's something else. But the next variable we're going to add is whether you've unlocked the contact or not. And what this allows us to do now that we've added two variables is right here in the data table where we return an unknown number. Just after we set the UI, we can actually connect to the row found and it's not an unlock context. So it doesn't exist and it's not a game law context. So we can leave that unticked. So on the event graph now, after we call this, we know whether or not we need to say the operator this number does not exist or we can say this person is busy equally just in this number here where we check if the player has unlocked it we know it's a game law contact so we can tick it but we know it's not an unlocked contact so we can keep that unticked and likewise right here at the end we can tick both of these because we know if you've got this far whether or not they have a profile picture it is an unlocked contact and we can compile and save. So if it is an unknown number, we're going to create a new function just called update unknown UI. And this actually is really, really simple. This one, I'm just going to grab the profile picture. I'm going to set its brush from a texture and I'm just going to set it to the unknown texture. And then I'm going to drag in the TXT contact name and I'm going to set its text to blank. And now if we compile and save, we can jump back to the update UI. And just inside here, every time we call unknown number, we will just pass in the unknown update UI. So we don't know what contact it is, meaning it's not a game law. We will unknown UI. And if we don't know what contact it is either, then we will unknown UI it. So now if we come back to the event graph here, we have now got an update UI, which will update this UI here, depending on what number we've typed in, whether or not it will work. And then we can promote both these to a variable. So game law contact, and then we'll promote unlocked contact as well, because we're going to do some more things with this down the line. And it's just a bit easier if it's in a variable. And then the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to create a sound 2D so we can play the ringing sound. So I'm going to spawn a sound 2D. 2D. I'm going to attach the ringing to it, which is my ring one phone ring. I'm then, then going to promote this to a variable called audio comp. And this is going to be so we can clear it up after we finish with it. And then from here, I'm going to assign an event onto the audio finished. So when the ringing is finished, we know we can wait for a moment and then play the ringing again. So as soon as the audio is finished, when we're starting to ring, I know we can grab the random rings to play and we can minus minus off of it and the decrement int automatically sets it as well so that's all good and then from here we can just add a delay in just a random delay of something like 0.2 it doesn't matter it's just to break up the audio a little bit and then from this random rings to play and drag it in we can say if it's more than zero and we can add a branch in if it's more than zero then it means we've still got rings we need to play so then we're going to drag up here and just call play off of the audio so i'm going to drag in the audio comp here and i'm actually going to right click it and do get validated get this is just a little error prevention in case if we do cycle back around here for some reason and the audio comp doesn't exist it won't play again and from here i'll just drag up and do play and then from the true we will just drag this up just before the validator get us here and that will basically play the ring again and this is our little miniature loop now so it'll come in create the sound it will bind to the audio finished and then it'll play the sound once it finishes playing the sound it'll come down here remove the random rings wait for a moment check if it needs to play again if it does it will come back up and play again which when it finishes will come back down to this event run the sequence again all the way until random rings is less than is equal to or less than zero which it will hit the false which is then where we proceed to start unbinding from it and doing other aspects so i'm going to drag the audio comp in down here and i am going to convert it to a validated get again because if you press the hang up it will kill the audio comp and then this will attempt to come down and play again in which case it will check it's not valid and just 
just stop playing it. So from this audio comp, I'm going to unbind all events from audio finish. Because we create it here, we're safe to assume nothing else uses it. So we can unbind all events from it, which will unbind the event here. So now that the ring has finished, it's saying calling. We know it's contacted and got through to something, whether it's the operator or whatever. So we can drag the status in to in call we can plug that in then this is where we start checking our variables so we can play the correct dialogue so if the game law contact means does the number actually exist in our directory of numbers then we need to check all the way over here if the player has actually unlocked it and the way we do this is we first go and get the player so if it's a game law contact and it exists in our directory of numbers, then we need to check if the player is available to actually talk to them and if they've unlocked them. So the first thing I want to do is just drag in unlocked contacts. So have they unlocked it? The next thing is we need to actually check if the player is available to actually talk to them. Now, in my game so far, the only way you can't talk to a contact is if you're in dialogue already. If you're on a quest, you can talk to them. I don't care. So I'm going to right click and just get the player pawn. And if you're on a multiplayer game, you'll have to figure out how to get the multiplayer pawn version. Then I'm going to cast this to my first person character. You might have something else. And I'm just going to create this to a pure function because I know it's always going to be that character. And then I'm going to check if there is busy and is busy is a variable I've created and I set on my player and I just set it if they're in dialogue or other aspects where they can't do most things. And then from the is busy, I'm going to pull off a not boolean. And I'm going to join these two together with an and like so. So if the player is available and the contact is unlocked, then we can branch off and we know we can play one type of dialogue. So I'll just connect that up like so. And I'm going to highlight all of this. I'm going to add a comment saying, is the contact unlocked and is the player not busy? I'm also just going to highlight this branch while I'm here because I've done an appalling amount of comments and do does the number exist? And, and eventually I will go back through and update these properly with comments because it's easier to read. So what I'm actually going to do is branch off to the false one first because this is actually a really easy one. So I'm going to drag in the audio comp here and I'm going to set its sound here. Now at this point we don't need to worry about if the audio component exists because the chances of the player pressing the hang up button between this node here and this one is I, I think impossible it's not even going to be a single frame of a cpu cycle so that should be fine so i'm going to set the sound to the number you are trying is a 11 labs thing i generated there we go and then if we set the sound there then we can drag off from the audio comp and then i can bind to the event finished so bind on bind event to audio finished like so I can create an event down here and then in here I will create a new matching event called phone call ended and it will do some funky stuff with this later but for now we're just going to come back up here and then final thing here is we'll just call play. So this is the first dialogue we've actually got from the phone now and I'm going to wrap this saying unknown number play sound and I'm going to set it to red because we know this is a bad one if you've got here you've you've typed in a bad number basically and that's the first dialogue we're going to play the next one we're going to come back over here is another unknown one so from the false but it's ever so slightly different so I'm going to drag in the contact info so by this point we know the contact exists or they're busy so they can't take the phone call so either way we can play the contact's phone number I'm going to drag off from here and I'm going to do a break. I'm going to tick all hide unconnected pins and I'm just going to untick line busy sound. And from here, I'm going to do async load asset. And this is basically going to go and get the pointer to this line sound and load it into memory so we can play it. You're talking nanoseconds. It's not going to delay your game very much at all unless you're on a really slow computer. From here, I'm going to cast it to a sound base. And then make sure it's connected to the completed. I don't know why it auto connects to the top one. You, you're nearly, it's always going to error if it does that. And then from here, I can grab my audio comp. I can set the sound and plug it into the sound base. I can connect it up to here. Then I can grab the audio comp and I can call play on the voicemail of the person saying, I'm not here right now. And that will work whether or not they are, they know you or not. If you did want a separate sound for whether they knew you, or it was just a generic voicemail. I don't know if you could do that in real life, but if you did, then all you need to do is edit this phone contact by the line busy and a line busy unknown or line busy known or something, and then just pick the correct sound. But one last thing we need to do is I just need to bump this across again. And then just like we did over here, where I bound to call ended, I'm going to copy the bind event here, and I'm just going to paste it here. So it calls the exact same function call ended and I'll paste it here. You might be wondering why we're doing this here twice and not just doing it at the beginning. And that's because on the true one, we need to handle it ever so slightly differently. 
and this is the next one done so i can now highlight all of this drop it down a little bit and i will put contact unknown or player is busy and i will set this to red again Let's set it to orange it's slightly better at least you know who they are and then this is the final stage here where we play the actual dialogue with the person on the phone now there is a caveat with this one at the moment my dialogue does not have any options for the player to pick it automatically picks options for them this is because we want the options to probably be inside the phone when we pick them inside here when we pick them like grand theft auto does so i've opted to not put the options in and in the future i'll work on adding options here as a call dialogue options or something but if you do want the options there then theoretically you should be completely fine to add the dialogue options into your call with the with the person so now I've done this, I'm going to grab the contact info here and I'm actually going to get the dialogue here and I'm going to load it using async load class again and I'm going to connect it to the true. And then if we get a class, I'm going to cast it to a dialogue class so I can actually use it again. I'm going to untick that and move it to the completed. And then with my current dialogue, the way you begin it is you simply get the narrative component and then you call begin dialogue. But again, plug this into whatever dialogue system you use. And I can plug it into the as dialog there. But the only difference with it this time, we actually need to get the narrative component here. And I'm going to drag off and do assign event. I'm going to do assign on dialog finished. So when this dialog finishes, then I want it to instantly tell us here so we can handle it and do some funky stuff with it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get the narrative component again. And I'm just going to do unbind event from dialogue finished and i don't want to unbind all events because we could have a lot more things going off so instead i'm just going to plug this event in like so and then i'm going to call phone ended like normal there we are so you see we have to predict when narrative finishes and then call phone call ended so i can now drag this up and drag this one up and i can wrap this in one large comment saying play dialogue and I'm going to set it to green because we've successfully got through and talked to them. Oh, so I've got to set a default avatar. So I will just do drag off and I will just do get player porn. There we go. So the player can be the NPC avatar. That's just something to do with narrative. Uh, I'm going to come back and just add some better comments over here. So this ringing part here, uh, the vast majority of this is random ringing sounds. And that will just come up to the update UI, which in here will try to firstly get the number. So I'll drag this across a little bit and I'll set that to number. So that'll be all the data table stuff. This one will be all this over here will be setting image. And then this stuff down here will be gate contact exists unknown unknown at this stage and i'll set that to red so we know it's a semi failure point there we go and then this one will come off and set the image if they exist so a few more comments do make it a bit easier to read and if we jump back to our event graph this is where we can start clearing things up after all of that code so on the event end the first thing i'm going to do is drag in the contact info and i'm just going to set it to nothing so it's empty we don't need anything stored in it then i'm going to come and check if the audio component is valid i'll just right click convert to validate to get if it is valid then I'm going to drag off and call stop so it stops whatever call it's currently in whatever's happening if that's the operator or the I am not currently here I'm also going to come and unbind all events so when it finishes it just unbinds everything it's not going to worry about it and then I'm finally going to come and destroy this component so it doesn't exist anymore and then the other thing I'm going to do for my dialogue specifically is I'm going to actually check if they're still in dialogue so is in dialogue if they are in dialogue then I'm going to basically tell it to stop the dialogue and this is important that on your dialogue you have can be exited ticked if you've got can be exited unticked you won't be able to cancel it it'll just fail so I'll do try exit dialogue and I'll plug it into the true if it's false that's how a cleanup routine done clean up all variables the booleans doesn't the booleans don't really matter all the ui doesn't really matter it'll get reset on load anyway this one will just set the main phone widget so that one's fine to stay now this call ended is what we want to do when we actually tell it to end the call so the first thing i'm going to do is get my status and i'm going to set its text to ended so it'll say call ended and drag that in the next thing i want to do is i want the place to actually see the word ended so i'm going to add a delay node in of a random amount so something like 0.5 seconds or half a second and then i'm finally going to drag in our phone widget and call hide phone like so i'll just wrap that in a comment saying phone call has ended clear 
home call has ended. And the final thing we need to do, if we come back to the designer, is add a click event to the hang up button here. So the last thing this hang up button needs to do is simply just end this screen. So I'm going to grab the phone widget and I'm just going to call change screen. And I'm going to plug in the active widget index and plug it into here. This will be the hang up button, which will, once the change screen is called, at the very start of change screen, it calls end on the existing one, which will stop the audio, stop the dialogue, clean it all up, and then change to the new screen. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I think that might be it. If we come to our phone and search for call and drag it in, we can see it looks all good. It's looking good. That's good. So we can save and compile. And one last thing that I've just debugged because I completely forgot is when you spawn your sound just make sure you click this little arrow and untick auto destroy this has got me so many times make sure you untick auto destroy otherwise it will not work so if we start you click the people and you can see we have our phone we can't click any of these but if I click the call I can come in and type in a random number and click call you can see it's now calling that's the first ring there's the second ring the number you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Please try again later. There we go. It said end of the display. There's our phone, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, it looks so cool. So now if we open it up again, there's our phone. It opens up correctly. Click the phone. Let's try 999 and click call. So this knows it's a contact. It's selected police. There's the second ring. Going for three rings again this time. Hello, police here. How may I help? My wife put on a sexy officer outfit and arrested me on suspicion of being good in bed. After a short trial, I was found not guilty. That's not funny. Do not call this number again. Ended perfectly. There we go, we've annoyed the policeman. Now, for the final test, does it know the unknown contact? Now, I don't actually know the, 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 the contact's phone number, so let's go and have a look. I'm gonna drag this onto my second monitor so I can see it. So I need to type in on here, and it's frozen because that's a proper number. So we click call. It doesn't know who it is, so it's not said. It says it's anonymous. Hey, this is Lily. I'm not here right now, so leave a message. Unless you are cops, then I'm not here. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. Voicemail. We now have unknown numbers, named numbers, and busy unknown contact numbers. How cool is that? It's such a cool system and you can expand it as much as you want. So at the moment, we have these buttons up here, which I probably should disable because they don't do anything yet. But the plan is you can really tweak this however you like. One of them will eventually be a contacts one. You can have little miniature games on there. You can have anything you want, really. If you really wanted, you could have a, a camera button like you do in most games as well. So yes, there is our phone system. Ladies and gentlemen, how cool is that? So the last few tweaks I'm going to do, I'm just going to come into the menu and I'm going to disable these two buttons here. So I'm going to untick them because we don't want them to do anything. And while we're here, I'll just set the widget switcher index back to the menu so it doesn't break anything. And then the final thing is we just need to shrink this phone just a little bit because it's a bit big. So I will multiply this size X by 0.8 just to shrink it a little bit and I will do the same here where I'll multiply it by 0.8 just to shrink it down just a little bit and you'll notice our CP screen isn't lined up with the screen anymore so we can just drag this up and make it line up perfectly with the screen and what this is going to do is basically just make it smaller on the screen because at the moment it was taking up like half the screen and now if we try it it should be a lot smaller there we go that's better that's a much better size and we can't click anything except this first one and with some better UI obviously it'll look much better but we can click it we can call there's enough room for everything to fit on hello police here how may i help police officer knocked on my door and asked sir your dog has been chasing a boy up the road on his bike i replied sorry officer you must have the wrong house my dog doesn't own a bike that's not funny do not call this number again there we go how cool is that ladies and gentlemen such a cool concept for a phone now for you narrative people if your narrative is actually on top of the phone um the easiest fix i can think to resolve it is to actually spawn the narrative ui on top of the hood which is as simple as taking the hood that you do dragging it before and spawning narrative after so that way narrative will always spawn on top of your hood rather than spawning under it because now it's spawned after the z-axis of it spawning should be on top now we should see the text of the dialogue on top of the phone. If I come in, just select that and go uh, nine, run it, first one, second one, 
uh, and there we go it's sitting on top of it and you can see when i escape the dialogue it quit it as well and as soon as we hang up bang it ends it won't restart it won't do anything and that counts if you're in the middle of dialogue and it's calling but i'm gonna click hang up and then it stops immediately how cool is that ladies and gentlemen a proper phone system there we go ladies and gentlemen that is the phone system i am here to present to you today if you have enjoyed this tutorial please comment below thank you for sticking through with it it's a good one and there's plenty of different ways we can take it if you've got any ideas or you want to see more please let me know down below please like comment and subscribe my name is decryption and i will see you next time